We are now recording. Welcome everyone. I'm Sandy Capra. I'm from Minwift. I'm on their board of directors. And this past year, um, along with everyone else, we have had to adjust for the pandemic and are doing things online. We have found that this is a very accessible and inclusive way to allow people to participate. And um, so we will have a couple poll questions. And one that I'm going to be asking you is, would you have been able to participate in person? Um, even though some people prefer not to be online, there really is um, an accessibility, a wonderful accessibility factor and inclusivity factor. So we're happy about that. MinWift is committed to supporting, educating, empowering, and engaging individuals to support women in the film and television, new media, all screen industries. And we are very excited tonight to be partnering with Docu Club Minnesota and Film North to present this. And they are also passionate about those qualities and our mission. Uh, coincidentally, all four filmmakers have taken classes at Film North and um, most of them are also part of Docu Club Minnesota. I'm very excited to have a few people here today. I'm gonna to mention them and we'll introduce them as we go along. But my partner, Chris Newberry from Docu Club, will be helping facilitate uh, the films this evening, just as he does with Docu Club. Docu Club is an organization that has monthly meetings. They were in person and now they're online and they've gone to an every other month. And so we are, we've slotted into the middle of their every other month. So Chris, I'm so excited to have you here with me tonight. And then another very special guest that is going to be speaking with you is Melody Gilbert. Melody is a founding member of Minwift and also DocuClub. She is a documentarian that has taught students around the world, lived internationally to teach students, um, has taught all over the US, has made many, many documentaries and we all look to her for guidance, support, advice, wisdom, and hard messages when we need to hear them. So everyone's really excited to have Melody here today. And um, we have four filmmakers. So the, um, the films are kind of in order of what happens. We have one filmmaker who is in the very beginning stages. She has a ton of footage and she's trying to put her story together. Her name is We, and um, she is, she has a very unique background and um, we'll let her tell you about it, but ethno research, I don't even know if I have that right, but she is a retired dancer. And so she studies dance in different cultures and she has an incredible story from Ethiopia. Um, lots of interesting messages. We also have um, uh, another filmmaker who, finished a Film North class, has, has put her film together, and she's doing final tweaks. She hasn't gone through sound or color correction. Christina Arellano. How's your son, or why? Ariano. Ariano. Yes. And um, then we have Wendy Johnson, who is now finished and is figuring out what to do with her film. All three of these filmmakers studied um, at Film North with Thalia, I think she is also on the line and she is one uh, also on the call. She is one of our special guests this evening. I was looking to see if I could find her quickly. I thought I saw her sign on. Um, and then our- Thalia's just coming in right now. She's just coming in. Thalia Drury. Um, I also took her class. So I was in the class with We, and I'm working on a fun little documentary myself. And then our final filmmaker, Rita Davern, she studied with Melody Gilbert at Film North. And we're going to see her trailer. Her, her movie is finished. It's been showing on TPT. And there's one more opportunity on April 7th if you wanted to see it. Get your DVRs set. It's, I think, at 3 in the morning. Um, so we're excited to have all of you here today. Um, let me see if there were any other messages I wanted to share. Um, I, th I think that's basic, but I do want to put a poll up and ask you a few questions. Um, let me know if you, oops, let me see here. Oh, you're viewing it and answering the questions. That was fast. Where? Do you see it? Chris, can you give me feedback? Is the poll up on the screen? 
Well, I, <clears throat> I have it on my screen. It comes up as a separate window. Um, <clears throat> but you oh, did, uh, click on you did uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it, it's out, up there for me it. because you, you uh, loaded it earlier for me. Are, are other people seeing it? No? You have to click on the polls icon at the bottom of the screen. Ah, there you go. Oh, polling icon. Yeah, there you go. And there Thanks, should Wendy. be four questions. We we're just curious about our audience. A lot of DocuClub Minnesota people on the line. So again, if you're just um, looking for it, click on polling and answer the four questions. Now this poll itself is not anonymous. I have one at the end I'll use that is anonymous. We're just curious what organization you've been participating in in the last year or two. We're committed to partnerships and at the end of the evening or following, we may ask you how tonight went and if you want us to do more events like this. Over half of uh, the people in the room are filmmakers and um, many are working on their first documentary. And um, many are here to support documentarians. And look at that. 70% uh, answering right now would not have been able to participate in person. So I think it's good for us all to have feedback as much as we want to be in person. And this really is uh, something we enjoy doing socially. Some of these events truly um, have more accessibility if we do them online. I'm often in another place and as some are, some are you. So I am going to and this poll. Um, we've had 21 of you have uh, responded out of 28. I think that's pretty good. Do you think so, Chris? Should I end this poll? Muted, Chris. <laughs> that was an affirmative. <laughs> affirmative. Okay. Sure, let's end it. Yep. So I have ended the poll. I, I don't know if you could see the results, but I'm it oh. says I'm sharing the results right now. Can you see the results? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Neat. Never used that feature before. Yeah. Well, my background is in um, corporate change management, and we like to get feedback <laughs> from people. So I'm going to stop sharing and let's see here. I've got my other screen here. I wanted to download it and um, let me just move it out of the way. So, all right, well, let's get on with our screenings. The order that we're going to be screening, first, we're going to be starting with uh, Christina. I'm sorry, I wanna just um, bring up my list here. We're, we're going to be starting with Christina's film, Not the End. Christina is a professional musician and um, has gone through a life event. She attended Thalia's class. And um, I think we're really excited to be showing, is this the first time, Christine, is this the first time your film has been screened? Yes. This is my first documentary actually, so. Great. All right, okay. I am making sure that I am sharing it appropriately here. So we're going to start start with the screening, this screening, we're going to jump right into it. Shall we? Is there something else you wanted to uh, share, Chris? Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, ask um, it's sometimes kind of nice to know what stage you're at and uh, how long uh, it is, what you're showing. So my film is somewhere near the end. It needs color correction and sound, but it's my first documentary so i'm sure i could use other improvements beyond color correction and sound but 
I was at the stage where I just needed to like get feedback from other people. It's 13 minutes long and yeah. Great. So oh is God. this, is this her first feedback session? I, sh I showed a couple of friends. Oh, so. that doesn't count. Okay. Right. So this is my first <laughs> feedback session. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this is my first time doing anything like this. So. Great. Stepping out. Yeah. Well, well then from, from here on out, we sometimes like to just let the work speak for itself and we'll have a discussion afterwards. Sure. One second here, I have to do something. It's pretty a, a horrible feeling to know that you have no control and you feel pretty helpless and hopeless and there's nothing that you can do. Uh, just over two years ago, I was driving my two nieces and husband to go camping when a pickup truck pulled out in front of us on the highway. Thankfully, we all survived the crash, but I sustained a severe lower back injury and spent 16 months in physical therapy. Sitting was so painful, I had to take cushions with me everywhere I went for over a year. I didn't know if I would ever be able to perform again on the piano or violin. Five months later, my niece, who was in the car accident with me in the front seat, fell at school and 24 hours later she was diagnosed with an incurable brain tumor called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma at the age of 12. <laughs> and we were very close we spent a lot of time together and seven months later she died Four months after that, I was fighting a head cold and I woke up late one Friday morning, threw my clothes on, rushed off to school where I had to accompany college music students on the piano for their end of semester music juries. And I sat down at the piano, played the first few notes and realized I had overnight almost gone deaf in my left ear. Mm. When I went into the doctors, they diagnosed me with a bacterial ear infection, but they think also a virus um, traveled to the eardrum and that's what caused the nerve damage. I developed tinnitus. The biggest challenges are noisy environments. So when there's background noise, it makes it very difficult to hear. I have an unusual type of hearing loss. I have something called reverse slope hearing loss, which is uncommon. Um, and so most people, they lose the notes on the high side of the piano, the high range. Um, I lost the notes on the low range of the piano. 
My hearing aid helps me hear better, but hearing aids aren't made for music. They're made for speech, so music always sounds a bit distorted. For a long time, I didn't know if I would ever be able to recover that same sense of joy that I had before all these horrible things happened. Children know, you know, that bad things happen and they write about them in their stories. So I felt a responsibility to not only teach so my students how here? to play an instrument, but how to play the game of life. Uh, so which picture has the fairies in? What's happening right there? So, if I gave up and succumbed to the physical and emotional pain, what kind of lesson would that teach my students? three things that helped me. Um, I began looking up inspiring videos on the internet, on YouTube, several spiritual videos, but also inspirational speakers of people who've made life changes. I talked to a counselor a few times and I felt that was really helpful. And she um, gave me some good advice. She said, you know, it's really important to grieve this loss and don't deny yourself that opportunity, but set aside some time one day a week or maybe just a few hours and do your grieving and then the rest of the time try to fill your time with other things that will keep your mind off of it. And one of the things that I actually discovered this spring as I was dealing with this was video production. And I actually fell into that completely unrelated to the hearing loss. Uh, when the COVID struck our state and I realized we were going to be going to online music lessons, I just randomly grabbed my iPad, which has iMovie on it, and I, for the first time ever, decided to make a little video explaining how easy uh, online piano lessons and violin lessons would be. And it was just, I, th I had so much fun. I thought, oh my gosh. And then um, the, the week that we went completely online, I composed a piece called Missing You. I was just, you know, missing my students and I was missing my niece, Adriana, and I was missing my dad who had died several years before that. When the nerve damage um, diagnosis came, video production was really what one of the things that saved my butt. I 
had no clue what I was doing. I, I was just having fun with it and distracting my mind from the hearing loss. The summer, I decided to take a documentary filmmaking class. Actually, I used the class to ex explore the whole experience of my car accident and um, documenting some of my experiences going through getting my first hearing aid. And then finally this fall, I signed up for video production classes at North Central Technical College. This past August, my husband and I took a trip out to Denver, Colorado. And what made this trip particularly meaningful is that after my car accident, I would spend hours and hours visualizing myself walking through the mountains while I was in the pool doing my rehab. And so that goal became a reality when we stopped by a little roadside scenic overlook and took a short hike through the mountains in Denver. And by accident, I came across this image. It symbolizes a decision that I've had to make regarding my life and how I am going to choose to live it, despite not being able to undo some of the things that have happened. You know, I've always really loved music a lot, but my great passion for it, that was not there in the beginning. That high level degree of passion and love an emotional attachment grew with time. And it was something that was earned through hard work and persistence and through a lot of ups and downs. I mean, if you're a professional musician, you've, you've hit the mountaintops and you've hit the valleys. You know, you've gone into the dark depths of despair because you just are not making any progress and things suck. Uh, and you just keep going because your love of music keeps you going. And now it sucks because I've spent my whole career, my whole life, you know, pursuing music and now I've got this stupid hearing loss, which just, ugh, it's really frustrating and it's really upsetting still. But when I made that realization that my love was developed out of hard work, I realized that this hearing loss was not the end for me because I know I can take that same sort of energy and put it in any direction in my life. And over time, I believe that I can regain that sort of love. And, you know, will that not be music? It pains me to think that it won't be music, at least in the same way it was. But I know that my life is not over. My career is not over. So don't give up, you know, take control of what you can and release what you can't take control of to God and keep moving forward. Life does not end. That was lovely. Christina, thank you for sharing so much. Thank you. Well done. So, um, <clears throat> at, you know, as a uh, first time uh, person experiencing feedback session uh, and a lot of folks who, uh, who are maybe attending their first uh, feedback uh, format uh, online, a meeting here today. I just want to um, 
set some sort of uh, expectations from the get go. Um, you all look like really nice people from your from your pictures, your fa your faces that I can see on screen. Uh, so I doubt that there's any anyone coming swinging in uh, with mean spirit. But um, I just want to say that it, I'm I'm going to bring the same um, philosophy that we bring to Docu Club that uh, it's uh, you know the the most productive way of receiving feedback for anybody, a seasoned filmmaker or a first timer, is to receive it as constructive feedback. So if you have um, <clears throat> I, and and uh, I can also say that just because I'm uh, pointing that out from the beginning it doesn't mean that uh if you have some some feedback that um you think will help improve the the film something that you thought wasn't working uh don't be shy because that's the only way um that we all can improve so um but i just wanted to make sure that we are all really respectful when we're giving our feedback um so with that said uh i'd like to maybe um Christina, I'll give you an opportunity maybe in a few minutes to ask some specific questions uh, of the group, but I think a really good way um, to kind of uh, start things off is uh, usually to just see if folks have um, some, some general thoughts. Uh, we have a big group here today. Um, I don't know that we could really institute a raise hand thing. Um, I guess we could if things get out of hand, but Let's start. Let's start by just letting folks uh, unmute themselves and and um, and jump in with any comments. And if we have to moderate, uh, we will. Uh, so, does anybody want to start off with any uh, any general thoughts, any first impressions of what what you've just seen? Looks like Kelly. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hi, Christina. Nice job. Um, it would be very impressive for being your first um, doc. Um, I just thought it was just a comment. Um, I don't know how many people have actually seen the narrative film, uh, Sound of Metal, but I just thought it, because I saw that recently, I just thought that it was very interesting in that movie. Um, they did a lot with playing with sound to understand what he was going through. You did a little bit of that, but what I liked was was some of the visual techniques that you used to, um, you know, illustrate that point in a, in a visual way. So I, I thought it was a very, I thought you made some very interesting choices to get the viewer to really understand what, what you're going through. Thank you. Could you say it was this, the, the documentary you were saying, Sound of Metal, like, like oh, a no, field? It's a narrative. It's, it's nominated for an Indie Spirit Award and an Oscar. Was it it's metal? Is it like the metal? And it's about hearing loss. Okay. Kelly, put the name in the um in the chat so she can see it. So Thank everyone you. can see. It. Absolutely. Good job. Thank you. Anyone else have, have some uh, uh, initial things they'd like to initial impressions they'd like to share with Christina? I'll just say it was some beautiful storytelling um, about trauma and healing and the process and the hopefulness of it. It had a really good message. Thank you. Yes, Cindy, did you wanna unmute yourself and say something? <clears throat> I'm one of Christina's piano students, so I cannot pass up the opportunity to give her feedback because she's always giving me feedback. Um, Christina, it was, like, <laughs> it was a pleasure to, to watch this. Um, yeah, as you have been describing, putting it together these past few months. And I too really appreciated how you showed what it, what it sounds like when your hearing is good and when the music, what it sounds like when the hearing is not so good. Um, I love that aspect of it. I felt really with you emotionally through this whole thing in your, the pace of your written, of your spoken word, and then how the music really just went along with it in your own written compositions of the music, just beautifully set the mood and the tone for this entire thing. And I, I think it's just, um, 
it was gut, gut wrenching, gut wrenching. And it got me to know you a little bit more from the story as I've been with you these past few years, but getting to see it on film is really, it just stirs different amounts of emotion. Thank you. Yeah, Talia. Yeah, I don't want to Say too, I feel like I don't want to say too much because Christina and I have had so many conversations. <laughs> but I, what I would like to say is what some of those conversations were about. Um, and um, but first of all, I want to say, Christina, um, I love I love some of the changes you made. Um, Thank you. I, and you did that so fast. Um, you are like such. She worked so hard. It's unbelievable. Um, and um, I just one of the some of the discussions we were having about this piece because i mean where that first of all you do have a, an incredible visual gift that not everybody has i mean that you are able to see things and just to really hold on to that because it's it really comes through in this piece and i love some of the shots and um what our conversations were about because we when she first started it was very much an experiential piece where we were, she was going through this thing and it was really, um, that was more what the film was about. And then, um, so our conversations, because it's changed since then, have been about sort of the experiential documentary, not that this is elements, the experiential documentary elements versus motivational, a motivational piece versus, um, more you know expositional so not that all of these elements can't exist at once i'm just saying these are some of the some of the balance that i think um she's playing with a little bit i don't want to speak for you but just to talk about some of the things that we were talking about so um i think it's good to hear what people are getting from it um because to me, I think the most successful are the first section and the last. And I think I could see mm -hmm. doing more, you know, less explaining in the middle section. And I know you're already working on this. I can see it. And it's so much, I think, much better. But I think you could do it even more, um, of, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I would be curious to hear other people's comments about that because I've yapped so much about it I feel like I should be quiet. <laughs> Great to hear your perspective and, and your experience with this already. Looks like um, Mike Rihanna wanted to say something. Go ahead and unmute yourself Mike. <clears throat> Hello everybody. Yes and I came in a little late so I missed your uh, introduction Christina and I think I understood is this your first film ever? Yes. Okay excellent. Okay, well, what I was going to kind of say, and because I don't want to completely judge it because I missed the opening, but of what I saw, I think there's that tricky balance, and I speak from experience where I did a very personal work about me and my father and the issues of work. Um, it's really tough sometimes, especially when we're beginning to find that balance of what is universal and what is so personal that we don't get that others are going, oh, I don't know if I'm into this, you know, and I can't be specific enough because I didn't see the whole thing. But I think it's just that tricky balance. And of course there is a genre of journal film, of diary film, it goes back to this, Melody's nodding her head, happy birthday, Melody, miss you. And it's real tricky and it, it helps to know some of that history without not saying you get to go and do your own thing and figure it out but if it's an early cut, you're going to find some things. I'll be honest, when I finally looked back at my work and I had no one else saying, you know, cut the, people would say, cut this out. No, it's staying in. And I realized, and there's that old saying, you know, it's like cutting off your arms, your hands, whatever. I look at it now and I go, well, it's kind of like a therapy or a glorified home movie. And it's a 20 year old project and it never got its due, but that rests on my shoulders because I just had to make one work that was so personal, I'd listen to no one else. Mm -hmm. So that's the trick, that's the balance. And those of you who knew Al, I heard Al yelling a little bit in my back ear saying, you know, 
gives some of that kind of feedback that new filmmakers need where you're kind of tough, but it's tough love. So that's what I want to say, but I'm sorry I didn't get to see the whole thing because it had some wonderful images. I remember the little Legos on the keys. That's wonderful. So I like it when people kind of, especially when they're new, they just kind of try to hit, try to hit the fences. And sometimes you're striking on other times, you know, and baseball season's coming up. So that came easy, but it's true. And, you know, you're going to get other feedback, but in an early cut, like Chris was saying, our tradition with DocuClub is, you know, and when we're in a room, it's so much easier to be kind of gentle and tough at the same time because you're looking at the person and you get their nonverbals. But here, you know, so that's what I would say. That I saw some wonderful stuff. I have to see it again. But can I ask a question? Work is so tough. It can, just I ask a, can I ask you a question just to, I'm sure. trying to clarify? So do you feel what what you're trying to say is do you feel like i'm hitting too many points that it's that it's just too spread out well like i said i'd have to see it again i like the trip with you and your husband when you went to colorado and i like the piano stuff but then there was a couple of things with your daughters i didn't i didn't quite oh, okay so my niece my niece died. So in the first oh, part, sorry. I said, and I missed I had, them. yeah, I had a car accident. I had a car accident. I oh, lost my niece okay. and then I, I lost part of my hearing. Better. Yeah. No, a very traumatic. And obviously it's a piece that also probably is giving you some therapy. Sure. But, you know, sometimes audiences just, they feel for you, but when they're watching a work, they don't, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Personal work is just so tough because you're so close to it. Sure. You know, so I want to hear what others have to say, but I just thought I'd lead off with a little bit of new filmmaker and being just a little bit constructive criticism. And that's Go sort of my it. thoughts. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's Thank really you. tough with personal work. I'll mute myself. Looks like, um, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? And oh, oh, oh that's a someone clapping. And look, I thought it was a hand raised. <laughs> um, I did want to um, give Christina you, you an opportunity to ask, uh, and I'll have to apologize, this is very relevant to, to the film we just watched. You may hear my daughter uh, playing her piano for her piano lessons in the background. So. Actually, I Sorry. saw it looked, like, it looked like Rita was going to make a comment and oh, okay. melody, so I'd, I'd be more interested in hearing Oh yeah, it looks like we got a couple, say. yeah, several. All right, good. Well, we got opened up the floodgates here. So uh, I have Melody might have hit the pedal first there. So Melody, you want to unmute yourself? Actually, I'd like to hear what Rita has to say first and then come back to me. Because she's been through this process. So I want to hear what she thinks. OK, Rita. Sure. Um, I What I really appreciate about this short, it, Christina, is the stunning creative use of visuals to talk about sound. I mean, that was the juxtaposition of that was just, I was fascinated from the beginning. So mm -hmm. you had me and my um, kind of related suggestion would be something I did early on that made such a difference is if you couldn't use your words, how would you tell the story if you had no words? How would you tell the story visually? And it's such a good exercise, not that you don't need some words, but I think that would be the balance that I would play with, you know, I suggest playing with. Thank you. We oh, have a couple more people, Chris, um, Patricia Eby and Wendy Johnson. I was on mute. Wendy, do you want to go ahead? Okay, sure, sure. Um, I was just thinking how it, it's tough to make a documentary about such potentially depressing trauma. Hi, Christina. Uh, and without it um, totally I bringing, had, uh, without I it interference in the streaming. So I, I would love to go back and, and look at it again. But I saw, I have to agree that, that uh, um, visually sound was, was just really great. What surprised me where it went with the turn that it took 
that surprised me was the student. And you and I both being teachers, that, that tugged at my heart as to, I've had this trauma and I've learned from it. And now I need to take that as the teacher and help my students to, to know that there's life out there. And, um, and, and I, I guess I would like to see- No, Patricia, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you're- uh, What's going with the student? Your signal's a little um, choppy. So, you know, this is a great, uh, a great segue for something I wanted to point out. Uh, there's a chat function on Zoom for anyone who hasn't used it. Um, go ahead down at the bottom and choose chat. Uh, there's already been a lot of great uh, comments uh, added to the chat. And in cases where your signal might not be that great that we won't be able to hear you, which is the case for you, Patricia, uh, you might take advantage of that tool. And anybody who doesn't have a chance to, to uh, give, give their feedback or make comments uh, live uh, uh, on, on this Zoom call, please feel free to add to the, to the uh, chat. And I will try and get uh, the transcript of the chat, the, the printout of the chat to all the filmmakers uh, at the end of the night so they don't have to be uh, cruising through it uh, throughout the meeting. So uh, that's, that's always good. Um, so Wendy, uh, you didn't get a chance to finish your your. Yeah, uh, this will make me more succinct then. Um, just I, it's it's tough to make a film about something so serious, and I think just your addition of uh, children in it, and then the playfulness of you know, like the Lego thing, and but uh, um, I loved the the interaction shown between you and your student when she was developing her own composition with the mermaids. Um, that's just, it's, you have to have some kind of levity in a, such a serious topic. So I thought that was effective. Thank you. Melody, did you want to, uh, I know you said you had a, qu a quick comment. Did you want to uh, piggyback on, on anything or, or add a thought? Sure. First of all, congratulations for first film. It's really special. And I think you're getting some good feedback here about your potential to you know, work in this field. It's really, you have a very creative eye. You're using your music. I always say good documentaries are like, um, you know, musical scores, right? They have their highs and their lows and ups and downs. And I do talk about that a lot. So I feel like you, you've done a good job with that, Christina. Um, one, it, it's, there's two small things. One is that I personally would rather not see you in the film talking mm -hmm. to the camera because you're narrating it. And then every time I see you on camera, you look the same, your facial expression doesn't change. I don't see the need to see you except mm -hmm. toward the end when you said, uh, something about the stupid hearing loss. I just mm. scribbled those words. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. My recommendation would be to try to cover all of those points when you are on camera, except for that. And then we see you finally toward the end. Um, so that's a small thing to play with since you're interested in playing with the visuals. And the other thing, it's a small thing, which is that there's no net sound under a lot of your B-roll. And that's often a beginner's mistake which is to just put up images without paying attention to the fact that there's no natural sound under there. So, you know, when there's wind and stuff and the natural sound should be there too, unless that was your experimental version, which is what Dolly is saying, where you did I just haven't gotten to it yet. Okay, yeah, sometimes, well, you said all you had left was color correction and whatever, and I'm like, uh oh, maybe she missed that. So I'm just mentioning that. I yeah. appreciate it though, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I just wondered what, could you just share briefly what your reasoning was to put yourself on camera like that? Well, so the interviewing thing, I had to do, I, I took some classes I mentioned at the North Central Technical College. Yeah. And so we had to do, an interview and I interviewed actually my audiologist who I could not put on camera for HIPAA reasons. So I just went with the interview style because that's what I was studying at the time. And I 
didn't think of your suggestion to not put me on camera. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, I'm not sure how other others feel about that, but it was just really jarring for me to see you interviewing yourself basically <laughs> is what it felt like while you're narrating the piece. And it does work on occasion. And I can tell you sometimes where it does work. For me, it didn't work here, but that's just my short comment. But otherwise, congrats. And tightening it up, like Mike said at the beginning, I think there's a lot of space places where it went too long and it could easily just show one little clip of something instead of the long stuff. But that's also, you know, up to you. That's great. Hey, Melody, can I just clarify one thing? Sure. Uh, so she does uh, appear in, in some B-roll and even some sort that's of avant-garde treatments. Yeah. You're not talking about removing those. It's just oh, no, that, only that one part... interview set up. Yeah, that interview set up. And by the way, the reason I said that one spot when you said something about the stupid hearing loss is that your face looked different and her tone, like the way she delivered that was different. The rest of it all just felt flat, you know, and I didn't get anything from you. I always say that when you get a chance to put yourself in it or have a, anytime you see someone's face, it should be something special, not just regular. So use yeah. that time wisely if you're going to use it. And I think it would be just as good with more of these beautiful images that Rita was talking about that will help us understand your feeling instead of you telling us this. We, I, you can tell it's an audio, but I would look at other images to cover that, except for that one spot or not at all, because we see you anyway. Good suggestion, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Melody. Um, I we do have a few more pieces, uh, so I did want to maybe wrap up soon. Uh, but does anyone else have any kind of burning thoughts they'd like to share? Um, share with the group? Um, no. Okay. Well, um, how about you, Christina? Was there any? Um, I, I asked you before, and it seemed like you'd rat you you chose to just hear people's initial thoughts, but I want to give you one more opportunity. If there's anything that you've thought of tonight or uh, leading up to tonight that it would be helpful to get a big group of people to weigh in on, and it can sometimes be a yes or no kind of thing uh, about, you know, yay or nay, or it can guess, be something more uh, involved. I guess my one big question is, does it feel like it's targeting too narrow of an audience? And what would I need to do to make it a, target a wider audience? I mean, if I'm going to put myself out there, I don't want to just say like only these five people would be interested. It's, you know, a pretty major story in my life. So that's my big question. My initial thought on that is, uh, and Mike, uh, you know, referred to there being sort of a genre or a, certainly a tradition in documentary filmmaking of this first person, uh, you know, diary storytelling, very personal spoken in your own voice uh and this seems to fit into that genre and um and it's a it's a genre that has wide appeal um and the way you've treated it to my to my mind uh you know it definitely would mean that you i don't think it's there i'm sure there's niches of of people that may have special interests that you may find a an audience uh you know when it comes to some folks that maybe have been through the similar things or groups that work work around some of the issues that you brought up, but I think it has broad appeal. So let's just see, is anyone disagree with me? <laughs> anyone wanna jump in and say uh, that you feel like, oh, niche is a better way to go? Go ahead and raise raise a hand or, or uh, unmute yourself and say so. I think Melody's question was, is it made for a specific audience? Well, I was thinking of, my students or um, I, I go to church, so I'm a, I have a church music background. So people in my church, we might show it and have a discussion on traumatic experiences and grieving and stuff. So I kind of targeted them, but I'd like it to be a broader appeal than just those groups. I don't have plans for it currently beyond that, but you know, you never know where things lead if you decide to pursue them further. Talia, did you want to say something? Oh, just real quick, because I know um, I already talked, but um, just real quick, and Christina, we can talk about this more. I just, I think maybe, um, I think it does have a wide appeal, because, um, but I think the way to maybe even make it wider 
and we can work on this is that middle section is so very specific about I took this film class and I did this and I did this. I think if you, I mean, you could almost, and again, this is, strong, I sometimes have really corny ideas when I try to do it on the fly, but just, um, just, you know, almost making it like, and I, you know, I just tried everything. I tried this, I tried this. I could almost do it like a montage as, as one option where, um, and, and not explain every single little detail. I think the specifics of the middle section, it's so specific mm -hmm. and, um, and so regional. And so, you know, that um, again, that might appeal to a niche audience here or um, in your church or your students, but to widen that would be to just sort of broaden those things. I, I tried all these things and show some of the stuff you made. And I think that would, it, it could be shorter and less specific in that way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Anybody, oh, there was another, um, someone else had their hand up, um, but, Oh, Andrew, did you want to say something or it had already been covered? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you want to make it universal, I would be a little, I mean, I personally would, I love the end where it was universal that we all will fail in some way and we all need to pick ourselves up in some way. And I think if you maybe started with some introduction of that at the beginning and then hit it at the end. But every one of us has had a loss. Every one of us has had a setback. And um, I mean, there, um, that's whole, so uh, human and so universal. So I think I would probably hit that a little more. So saying, so in talking to the listeners or how would you do that? I mean, not put um, my face on screen, but say we've all had these experiences, like what? Yeah, so I, I think in the end, you sort of started to go into that. You know, I, you said I could have given up and I learned that I can rebuild my music and make it universal there. You know, I was at this point where it would have been very easy with all that I had gone through, so many one thing after another to just, you know, give up going a different direction, pull in my horns, uh, you know, pull myself in. And you decided that you have to, you know, pick yourself up, you have to get back to work. Um, you are incredibly young and for anybody, you know, your age to sort of say, my life is over, um, that would have been horrible and horrible for your students who are mostly young. Uh, but I mean, even at somebody of my age, uh, I'm not gonna give up. I mean, every day that I've got is some way to make me better. So I think that's where the universality comes in. I would just probably play it a little harder. I'd like to interrupt here for a couple reasons. Um, on the Minwif Facebook page, underneath the event, I've created a posting for each filmmaker. And I think we could probably fill this entire time just with Christina's film. So um, for Christina's sake, could we maybe take the rest of the discussion there? Everybody doesn't have each other's emails, but um, Andrew, I don't know if you're on Facebook, um, Wendy, um, no, okay. Um, well, uh, through the process, Whoever invited you, have them figure out how to reach me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat box and I can connect the filmmakers. But just for the sake of time, I'd like us to move forward. And I, I am happy to connect people uh, that wanna talk with the filmmakers about ideas. How does that sound? Thank you. Sounds good. So, Sounds great. Um, I think yeah. it's a good time to move on to we. Um, Christina was a professional musician. We has been a professional dancer and studied, and I might get this wrong, we, uh, um, ethno research. Do I have that right? Okay. So my name is pronounced Hui. It's Hui. okay. Sorry. Uh, and then um, ethnographic research is my expertise. I'm a sociologist. Yeah. And so what's interesting about you is you have somehow parlayed your love of dance into your research so you could travel around the world and study cultures and dance. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah, I do sociology of dance. So, yeah, I started, so, yeah. Did you want to say the name of your film so I don't pronounce it incorrectly? Oh, the name is Malaku's uh, Timkat Theory. Timkat is um, Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Festival. So it's his ideas about the festival. Chris, do you want to ask any more questions before we move to her film? Like, sure. Way same same thing for you. Just wondering, um, are you? Uh, and sorry, if, sorry if I missed this, but are you? This is a a piece that you're still working on that you might benefit some from some feedback. Yeah, yeah. This is you know um, my class with Thalia um, about a month ago was my only exposure to making documentary. So. Uh, it's my very first try and more like a class exercise. Um, so um, I've never had a session like this except for in class. I actually kind of gave up on it and but Sandra, Sandy, Sandy <laughs> wrote me in. So thank you for the encouragement. Yeah. Good. Well, that's I fun. I need to do one plug. This uh, That was an introduction. Wei and I were in Thalia's class at Film North. And so I do think that this is a nice marrying up of partnerships. So thank you, Wei, for agreeing to show your very first cuts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great. And it's what we're gonna watch is about five minutes long. Is that right? Yeah. All right, yeah, I think we can queue it up. And the Ganada Uh, 
እዛው ውስጥ በዛ ሂደት ውስጥ ነው እንደማር እና አኔ ጋር ልብ ውስጥ ነው በተሰጠኝ ንግዛብየ ተሰጠኝ ስጦታ ከዛ ጋር በጣም በቀላሉ እንድገናኝ ያደረገኝ የጥምቀት ባህሉ ነው ማይወጣ የጭፈራ አይነት ታለንት በቃ ታለንቶች በየቤቱ ለካ ምንም ሌላ ሲሰሩ ምን ሙዚቃ እንኳን አያጣሉ ለሽ ማገምቻቸው ሰዎች እዛ ጋር እንዲ ቃጉልበት ሲጨምሩ እና ሲደንሱ እንደ ናይት ክለብ ወይ እንደ ዝምብላሽሽ ይገዳ እንደሚል ሳይሆን በመቀደስ በማመስገን በእንባው ላይ መጣል በናፍቆት በመጸጸር በሁለቱ ደስታና ሀዘን ድብልቅ ኩራት ድብልቅ ወጣ በዚ አይነት ስሜት ነው የጥምቀት ያለውና ያ ማለት ምንድነው ሃይማኖቱ በጣም ማክበር አለ እሴቱን ባህሉ ማክበር አለ በሃይማኖቱ በባህሉ ባገሩ መኩራት አለ እና ደስ ያንኑ ላይ ሰበሰበ ነው ጥምቀትና ፈንድቃ እንዳልሹ አሁን ለሰባተኛ ጊዜ እንደዚህ ኦርጋናይዝ በማድረግ እንጂ ያው እኔ እድሜ ምኑ እዛ ሲጨፍርን ያደኩት ሰማርን ያለውትኝ አሁን እየተማርኩ ነው እና አሁን ደሞ ከፈንድቃ ፍሮች ጋር እንደውም በተጨማሪ ደሞ ከክፍለ ሀገር ራቅ ካሉት ቦታዎች እንደ ዳውሮች ጋሞች በማምጣት የካሚኬል ደብር ማዝሙሩ ላላቸው በጣም በሚገርም ሁኔታ እዛ እናሳልፋለን እና የፈለገን ያለ ነው እዛ ሳድግ ጥምቀት ላይ የካሚኬል ብዙ ጊዜ ራያዎችን እናገኛለን ጉራጌዎችን እናገኛለን ትግሬዎችን እናገኛለን ኦሮሞችን እናገኛለን ጎንደሪ ኩጃሚ ምንጃሮች እናገኛለን ይሁን ማህበረተኞች ሁላ እና በጣም ደስ የሚል ቃለም ነው ግን በብዛት አካባቢው ከመራቁ የተነሳ ነው መሰል እንደዚህ እንደ ወላይታ እንደ ሲዳማ እንደ አሁን ዳውሮቹ ጋሞቹ ሲመጡ ቀለማት ማዲስ አበባ የሁሉም ከተማ እንደመሆነ አመጣን እና ያፍሪካም ከተማ እንደመሆነ ካፒታል ሲቲ እንደመሆነ አመጣን እንደዚህን ነገሮች በተለይ ደግሞ አንተን ያደርጋል Okay, hey, that was great. Thank you for sharing. So, again, I thought uh, maybe a good place to start would be um to just open it up for any initial reactions that anybody would like to share. Maybe I can yeah. start? Sure. Go for it, Andres. All right. I thought it was a very in very interesting uh the one thing that I would have liked way to have seen was uh a quick setup of what Melaku Belai was right off the bat so I could uh uh enjoy more of the dancing and by that I don't mean a long definition of what it is or a narration Uh, by a you know by a professional narrator but even even the dancer that was talking later have some of that right away with uh, an interesting placement of the titles like you did and then move on to to see in the dances and to enjoy the enjoy them more um that's just right off the bat i guess okay so can i ask for cl clarification Yeah. So do you mean like the his whole idea to be put more in the forward and then just Yeah, it's more of a of a setup um as to what it is and why it is which he said but it didn't come in until later and given that it's a short uh you know we have very short pardon the pun attention spans uh I think it it would benefit from having it right away from the beginning so, so then, uh, then we can focus on the dance okay. to explain uh, the festival or to explain the person to explain the festival okay, okay. and then and, and the festival 
you know, he can he can describe it as it was, but earlier rather than later. Okay. Thank you. Oh, looks like yes. Wendy, you had something. Yeah, to, just to piggyback on what Andres said. Um, so at first I was confused about the term Timket and Melaku Bele. And I understand now that Timket is the festival and Melaku is the person. And I, that was hard for me to catch. And so just coming at it from a, a, a writer's perspective, an introduction since your reader or since your um, viewers, you can assume they're not familiar with Ethiopia or the culture, some kind of background in the introduction, even like a graphic of where Ethiopia is and where the city is, um, and it's the capital and, um, and, and maybe just establishing the main character, the dancer, with just a shot of him so we can get place, character, in position. Yeah. Good advice. And Christina, I think you had something, right? I just want to clarify something and then respond based on your answer. It's, is my understanding that in this festival, the dance in itself is part of the Christian church expression. Is that correct? So then then my understanding from what I saw is that this man who was featured, was I seeing that, understanding that, that Christians thought his particular dancing was not in keeping with their the Christianity beliefs? Yeah. So, so what I'm understanding is there's a struggle that, okay, the dance is part of the Christian festival, but then there's people who are attending this festival and dancing, but their way of dancing is not considered Christian-like behavior. Yeah, yeah. Is, so that's a really, to me, that's a really interesting concept that needs to be made more clear from the very beginning, like this struggle of, well, what makes this dance Christian and what makes this dance not Christian? Yeah. What's like, for me as an outsider, I have no clue watching because I don't, I'm not familiar with this dance. Right. People who are in the culture who see it, they know because they grew up with it. But for somebody from the outside looking at it, like I would have no clue what would, like to me, it all looked the same. I mean, it was not mm -hmm. the same, but I wouldn't know what the difference is. So I find that a really interesting struggle that mm -hmm. if you could highlight or ex explain more or somehow clarify yeah. that struggle. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Andrew, did you have something you'd like to share? You're on mute. Uh, okay, thanks. So um, I think for, for, for all of Christianity, at least that's the one I'm uh, um, familiar with, when somebody performs at a church service, it, is, it should always be not them, not focusing on them, but it is focusing on the gift that God has given him or her. And, I, and when I saw the main uh, dancer, I wondered if he was a little too self promoting and I wonder if it was his dance or, or sort of his attitude. I saw other dancers that really seemed to be there for the joy and him maybe was a little more self promotive and I think one of the one of the one of the um, uh, headlines on there was he thanked God for this platform to perform. And that seemed like, uh, you know, that doesn't seem like I'm doing this to, to uh, uh, glorify God. It's just like, God gave me this and thank you for giving me this platform so people can see me. I wonder if that is the difference or is it like, or is it like Elvis Presley in the fifties? You know, I mean, this is, you know, something that we just you know, are not sure of and we don't know that it's appropriate. So I'm not sure why it's not, you know, it's not uh, accepted by the, the people, but that, that, you know, that's what I sort of thought when I, when I saw it. Yeah, there's just a lot of cultural background that, I, you know, it's impossible to explain in five minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't really know what to do with this. Um, you know, I, I, I actually struggle with like who the audience is. I don't, 
really, I work with Ethiopians so much that every any Ethiopian who watches this, of course, they get it. But um, so I have to, you know, explain uh, Orthodox Christian Christianity. They do. They actually their um, services are very embodied, but they don't call it dance. They call it uh, another word. And of course, dance in Ethiopia is also not called dance. They have another word for it. But so they use different words. Um, and Malaku is the last, the least self-promoting person you've ever you would ever meet as a, a celeb. You know, he is a national celebrity, but everybody respects him because he never really promotes himself. So I think part of that, you know, impression is is maybe how I presented him in the film. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of a lot of things. I mean, I think this is my question about translation. So I basically, I am, you know, trying to make a film or anything. I'm trying to translate, right, um, both the language and also um, the cultural context and content as well. So that's part of my struggle. One little aside way in the chat, which we will be getting to you, are some comments that you have been trying to figure out. One was a suggestion about maybe using voiceover. Mm -hmm. And one was a suggestion about um, the subtitles, should they appear all on the top, all on the bottom? Or, and I know you have been trying to figure out how the subtitles can be seen. So we don't yeah. need to spend a lot of time on that unless someone wanted to mention more, but I wanted you to know that that was yeah. pointed out in the chat. I have an opinion about the voiceover thing as a musician. Mm -hmm. If you do it, keep it minimal because I want to hear the music. Yeah. I think the music is so interesting. And if you do a lot of voiceover, you're going to miss half the experience of the dance. Yeah. That's my thinking too. I love the music. I love even the way um, he talks. Um, Amharic is very is a very musical language. So, um. Yeah, I think the, the, with the voiceover, you can use actually what he said there sporadically and cut in smaller chunks. Mm -hmm. And that would preserve the integrity of the music and give the people an, uh, a better understanding of what we're seeing. Dahlia, did you want to, uh, in our, do I understand that you were also an instructor of, of Way during the making of this? Is that right? Yeah. Yes, okay. and Wei, congratulations. You've done so much work. It's, a, it's Thank beautiful. You. Um, and all I was going to say, I'm just going to real quick jump off of the comments. Like, I, I was, um, I agree with Andres. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of this is about, um, it's already been brought up, but just about perspective. Um, I, I almost, it feels like you need to be in it somehow. Um, in, because it's your perspective. If we are the audience, if it's an American audience, I, I think perspective is point of view is the very first thing you need to look at here. Um, and, um, and that you're not really an explainer, you are an outsider, you know, um, just like so many of us here. So, and because I'm trying to keep this as succinct as possible, but, and we've had these discussions and it got brought up, but because it's such a complex um, subject, um, the indigenous um, practices are so complex. The Christianity is complex to me because I'm not Christian. <laughs> so it's all complex to me. But um, so um, I think knowing that, I feel like it either has to be a longer piece um, or it just, somehow um, needs to just explore, you know, the beauty of the dance or whatever. But I also just want to jump off the comment um, of Kim, the, the main character. He is a, he talks a lot and he's a fast talker and there's a lot coming at us at once. And I think, you know, we really do want to see the dance and we do want to understand this stuff. So um, I think I'm just agreeing with Andres. I don't want to repeat what you just said, but it should be broken up and some pauses and let us see the dance, let us experience the dance, you know, and, um, but also I think you need to just think about how, you know, the complexity of this and um, that it might need to be a longer piece with you as the narrator explaining it and translating it. Um, I don't mean literally translating, but 
the meaning, you know, simplifying what these things mean for us. I mean, without making them simplistic, because you don't want to do that. But I don't know if that makes sense. But these concepts are big, and um, somehow we need to see, we need to mm -hmm. have an entry point here. Yeah, I yeah I agree. I've been trying to simplify already. I don't know if you noticed. I already took a lot of the original words out, yes, yes. <laughs> like the specificity specificity of the ethnic groups and you know different kinds of dances. There's eighty four different eighty four different ethnic groups in Ethiopia. But so, I think that maybe yeah. somehow if you did have your voice, mm -hmm. your voiceover instead of there's a lot of text too, which is yeah. it's just a lot of work for us. It's a lot of, it's really interesting, but it's just a lot for us to look at and read. And I also want to know that you're there because you are there as an outsider, you know? And, um, and I think it's important now, I mean, more and more, you know, as a colonialist country, you know, we're always telling people, we're explaining it. I just, I like to see your presence there. Mm -hmm. Saying, I'm here. This is my point of view. I mean, not literally, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. are present and explaining from your perspective in some way. Yeah. And yeah. that can be discussed further. We can discuss it more, but. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, in my writing, I mean, this is like a, a, a side product of a 30 page academic paper, basically. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, what, you know, positioning myself. I actually believe in that firmly. So I do that in the paper and for this, because I wasn't actually there taking the footage. So yeah, I, it's, you know. it's, but it's beautiful, you know, it's beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah. And lots of uh, interesting comments and questions uh, are in the chat too. So we'll get that to you. Um, oh yeah, Michael, go ahead. Uh, well, I like, uh, I think we've got to start on something, and there's a lot of, we have a lot of uh, variety of information. You can go places with that, I feel. That's my comment. Thank you. So yeah. it sounds like maybe another, um, it, you're advocating possibly for um, this, this being one of those rare short films where we're telling you to make it longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I anybody else have? Uh, oh, I also way I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity is if there's any um, any questions you had for the group or thought you know thoughts you wanted to share with us. Yeah. Well, I I heard uh, Thalia talking or and a couple other people talking about genres. You know, I'm so new to this. I really don't know a lot of the technical terms. Um, so. And someone mentioned ethnographic film. Maybe this is an ethnographic film. So, um, but I, you know, I don't even know <laughs> where where it would fit. Um, so that might be the question. Yeah, I mean, as as it stands now, it does seem very much an extension of uh, of your academic work. So it does seem like that if it was to if we were to pigeonhole it now. It does feel like yeah, eth ethnography. Is that the right uh, mm -hmm. noun? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, I mean, they could with with some of the suggestions that have been given and and some work, um, it could become something, you know, that that might mm -hmm. fa fall into some other category, some bro broader category, broader appeal than just somebody who is already interested in ethnography or the specific um you know the ethiopia or or uh ethiopian dance or christianity yeah. in ethiopia but um yeah. yeah what kind of story did you want to bring across what kind of story did you want to bring across well the story is very much what um christina was talking about like the thrust of the story seems to be the contradiction between um his religious context and you know, he actually has a lot of respect for the religion and that I, you know, I like Thalia was suggesting in the class, I need to do an interview with him, 
myself. The interview was actually conducted by someone else. It was about the festivals, not so much about his personal relationship. So, um, but when I did, you know, like just phone interviews with him about Tim Good, he said a lot of really spiritual things to me and I couldn't really put in the film because I didn't, you know, record him um, visually anyway. So, so is that conflict that he, you know, believes in his religion, he thinks has, has a lot to offer to the country, to the world. At the same time, his practice was not accepted by um, the church, you know, um, so, so that's, I mean, you know, people dance all the time, as you can see, like um, m many of them who are believers, they also dance, but they have very specific, like you can only dance at a wedding, you can only dance at, um, you know, festivals like this, very special occasions. Like even when you're eating, at one time I was eating, I started moving and, and he said, no, don't dance when you eat. <laughs> so, so there's lots of specific regulations. And so that's the, that's the contradiction that I want to talk about is the, you know, and then he finds, you know, ironically, he finds the, his freedom in this religious context, in this uh, festival context. So that's- What does that have to do with your own faith? Did that do anything to your own faith at all? Sweet. My own faith. As far as what you saw. This will be our last question here, yeah. and then we'll move on to the next one. Yeah. I am not a Christian, so I, I I'm not really invested in um, the religious aspect. I'm, you know, just more interested in in his like dilemma, basically. Okay. Can I say thank you, Wei, and thank you everyone for your questions and your comments. And Wei, there's thank such you. a rich section of questions and comments in the chat. And um, I've asked you all if you mind if she uh, follows up with you individually. I know Wei is on Facebook and some of you are. So I think it's time to move to the next one. Do you, Chris? Sure, yeah, let's move on. And Thank Wendy you. is up next. Uh, for folks who have attended uh, Docu Club recently, yeah, I think it was our last meeting if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, we yeah. saw uh, this piece, right? And um, is it, I guess I should ask, have you done any, made any changes? Okay, it's the same. All right, good. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so you're all in for a treat, I can tell you. Um, and Wendy, would you, so you, um, if I remember correctly, this is uh, basically a finished piece, right? And you, do, do I have yeah. that right? Yep. Okay. So, but you, you still, as you did um, at our Docu Club meeting, would you like to hear some some feedback from folks? Oh yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. And it's about third. Is it 13? 13. Yeah. 13, 13 minutes, minutes long. And I okay. just want to say, Wendy, um, after Docu Club, and we talked about Min Wift. Thank you. You joined Min Wift, and so you're <laughs> a really good example of the partnership that we have going on today. So I will get okay. your movie started. Moving in with my dad after my mom died was like a walk through a forest. At first glance, you feel akin to your surroundings. Then you take a closer look down below around your feet, up over your head, and deep into your heart. There, you discover little secrets, those quiet, spectacular moments of love. My father was born on December 12, 1922, to Lyle and Ursula Johnson. They lived on a farm in Le Grand, Iowa. He was the first of three boys and a girl. 
These are facts easily known about any person with a birth certificate. I've known my father all my life, but until I lived with him again recently, I really didn't know him. He kept all kinds of little secrets. He wanted to keep the secrets to himself, or maybe he just didn't have the time, or just wasn't the right moment to share them. Of course, I lived with my father as a child until I was almost 18 when I left home, but that's different. When my mother died, my father was alone in the house for the first time after 68 years of marriage. At the time, I'd recently divorced after 30 years of marriage. Like my dad, I was living alone. But in my case, it was by choice. One afternoon, I asked him how he was doing. He said, when I can't make it up and down the stairs to do the laundry, I'll have to sell the house. Well, I can go up and down the stairs, I said. I can come here. I can live with you, and we'll figure this out together. So, after living in my house for only a year, I left. I moved in with my dad. Our agreement was for me to live with him for one year, and by the end of that year, we would have a plan for him. It was a sacred time with him, the time we spent together. I really got to know my father with a subtlety and a depth I think few people have the privilege to. This is when I discovered all these little secrets about my father. He eats seven prunes for breakfast, eight at noon, and four at dinner time to keep himself regular. He doesn't listen to the radio or any music, except for special occasions. When he works, his mind is enough. I wonder what goes on inside. According to Milenkovich's theory, there should have been no deglaciation at all. We measured the time 135, 136,000 years ago. He uses the same keyboard he's had for the past who knows how many years. The ink's worn off the keys. But adjusting to a new keyboard would be difficult because of his rheumatoid arthritis. He goes to bed early, about nine o'clock. He wakes up a few hours later to pee and does 42 laps around the living room and kitchen and then he sleeps until morning. Nice. He loves his zinnias. I gave him the seeds from my garden and he wishes He'd known about them years ago. He raises monarchs from tiny eggs to little caterpillars to big caterpillars to chrysalises to butterflies. He's done this since peanut butter came in glass jars. Well, this I knew before I lived with my dad. But when a caterpillar dies from some fungus, bacteria, a virus, or some genetic defect that keeps it from developing any further, his heart gives a little squeeze. I knew my father had a birth defect when I was five or six, he took us kids to the open swim at the junior high pool. 
You paid a quarter to get in. I loved water, but I wasn't a very good swimmer. So he taught me how to float on my back first, because if I were in trouble, I could stay afloat that way and survive for quite a while. As you can guess, I knew from a very young age of my father's birth defect. When he swam, it was the only time his chest was bare. He was a muscular man, all but for the right side of his chest. There, he had a significant concave void. And as it turned out, it was not so simple. He told me about when he was born. His grandfather, the town doctor, told his mother, this baby will never survive. My father was missing four or five ribs. Well, only skin between the outside and the lungs. Two or three more ribs were just stumps. One of several reasons for the army not taking me. The tips of his clavicles crisscrossed below his Adam's apple. Well, but you can't see one of them. One of them is kind of buried behind the other. The right side of his lower jaw protruded and his right hip socket was misaligned. The entire right side of his skeleton had one deformity or another, and who knew what deformities lingered inside his rib cage? But my father lived with this, has lived with this, his entire life. He knows no other way of being. He told me a story about going swimming with a bunch of boys in Davidson Creek, where it pours into the Iowa River. He was four or five years old. His mother said for the first and only time, Robert, keep your shirt on. And she didn't have to explain. He knew by the look on her face and the tone in her voice that he needed to be ashamed of his deformity. My father told me another story. When he was of courting age, before he left home to go to college in Des Moines, his mother made him a pad. With elastic straps, he could slip the pad into the bowl of his chest. It was like a firm but soft pillow. So when he hugged a woman, he would be whole. At the age of 25, he met my mother a high school senior on a blind date. He wore this pad so she would assume he was whole. And at a certain point, of course, he had to reveal his shame. But contrary to other women he dated, it didn't matter to her. She loved him so much. So when I lived with my father, he shared a few secrets with me. I learned how much he loved my mother. I learned how much he loved me. I learned how much he felt for anyone who struggled with circumstances beyond their control. Like Leo, his grandson, with Down syndrome. Or a monarch caterpillar's unexpected demise. Eight months into living with my father, I had to face the fact that I'd be leaving in a few months and someone needed to take my place. I had a house. I was in a serious relationship. The day that broke my heart was the day I sent this letter. Seeking live-in companion for my father in exchange for room and board. Bob is a retired Honeywell physicist and adjunct University of Minnesota professor of paleoclimatology. He's an intellectually and physically active elderly gentleman living in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Move in as early as August or as late as January for at least one year. A little background. 
Since my mother's death in October, I've been living with my dad for a transitional year. He's doing very well, still writing, researching, tending the garden, and laughing even in these unusual political times. However, our time together will end soon. We've explored many ideas on what phase two might look like. So if you are interested, that looks pretty good. let's talk. I'll feel much better knowing we've planned ahead. But when the time comes, I'll be sorry to leave his everyday companionship. Ooh, it's cold. Here. <laughs> Wear that inside. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. That's great. Thanks, Wendy, for sharing again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well for done. Well done. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that we could um, open it open it up for some uh, comments, uh, or if anyone has questions for Wendy, I will tell you that uh, one one uh, one treat that you're missing out on um, <laughs> today that we got to experience at Dr. Club last month was uh that when his dad was able to join us via zoom so that was kind of fun wow. he was able to answer some questions yeah he just had his second moderna shot um on friday and he was asleep all day today so he's a little out of it today <laughs> sometimes it does knock people out a little yeah. bit yeah okay anybody have some uh comments they'd like to share uh with wendy um i do i do Wendy, that was a wonderful film. Loved it. I think it was very, it's such an intimate look and such a, I don't know, a wonderful portrait of you and your dad. And I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> was that the first time you saw it? I, that's the first time I saw oh, it. Yeah, I missed, I missed okay. the, the yeah. meeting last yeah. time. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, uh, Michael. How does Matt, the title relate to your father? <laughs> or relate to the monarch butter butterfly? Right. Yeah, it's a play on the monarchs and a play on just kind of how our time together transformed us both, I would say. Um, in the in the beginning when I first got there it was you know shortly after my mom died and he was saying things like oh we're gonna have to get the house ready to sell next summer and oh I'm not gonna start any tomatoes because I can't have a garden you know he was kind of psyching himself up to just this is kind of the end of this phase of my life kind of a thing and by the time we got to May and June that had changed and um, so I think he, uh, through the grief and through all the support, he has five children. Um, he was able to have more confidence that he was going to be able to stay in his home and be happy staying in his home. So. Wendy, I have a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Can say a happy ending. What, what about what? Yeah, ending was a happy ending because your father learned to be by himself. Yeah, and uh, so I'm I'm just starting kind of a sequel or kind of the next um, mini doc about okay, so what does happen? Who does who does come to stay? And uh, and so that is going to be 
the theme of that is going to be answering the question, what is home? Um, and so really that it has an ending that's nice, but there's more to it, so. Oh, have you started on that yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just pulling, um, kind of pulling the clips together in a chronological line. And then I'm then just so I can get familiar with it again, which is really fun because um, this was shot in 2018 and coming back to it is very fresh. And I'm finding things like, oh, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> you know, I'm finding some real little gems in there. Thank you. That's fine. Andres, did you have something else to say? I just was wondering, where, are you doing anything with this short? Are you showing it anywhere? Are you taking it yeah, anywhere? Um, I have, well, that was when I showed it at Docu Club in a month ago or whenever that was, um, that was part of the feedback. I, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, um, but for the first stage, I'm just, I have it out to maybe 20 or 25 really inexpensive film festivals. And I've gotten one, ex one um, accepted and one not. And then most of them, you know, they're not gonna start notifying until May probably. But um, I'd like to, I guess my vision is to have a series of short documentaries that are all standalones, but they're a series in themselves, so they could, you know, be shown together, but have it be a tool um, for like social workers or hospice workers or anyone who has to do with um, planning for um, transitions in a, you know, in a person, elderly person's life. So. Well, that's one of the things is like, where can I get it? Because I can show it to my father-in-law. <laughs> I can send Ooh. you the link. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like, see, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, it looks like we've got some nice comments in the chat. So um, keep those coming if you're, if you're shy. But anybody else want to, um, yeah, Dahlia. No, I just wanted to say, I mean, great work. And I just love that swish pan when he's coming around the corner doing a lap <laughs> when he says nine. That's just, that's Everyone just, likes that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and also you were saying social work. I mean, obviously, and like Andres was saying, families. I mean, you know, this is a thing. Yeah. A real thing that people. Yeah. Need. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to I have to say it's uh from the first frame it engaged me. So kudos to you for that. Oh good, good. And uh interesting change of music pace. <laughs> so yeah. kudos for that also. Yeah. And Christina, I just wanted to mention um I inserted a lot of ambient sound effects. Um, so like the car driving, the keys in the door, um, the bird, all of the bird ambient sounds, all those things. And I just, I found those on um, like the Library of Congress has great, and, and also with the historical um, photos, like the boys swinging on the rope swing in the river. That was like in the 1940s. And so there's a lot of available non-copyrighted um, material in Library of Congress and some other other places where you can find video, photographs, sound effects, music. Lot. It was really fun doing that. Thanks for the suggestion. I was, I'm actually really glad that you showed your film tonight because somebody, I can't remember who it was, mentioned like, take me out of the interview style, you know, part of the film. So I feel like watching your film like really gave me some good ideas of how that would yeah, work. Good, yeah. It inspired me to figure out how to make that work for my own. Uh-huh. That's great. Yeah. That sounds like a win right there. Ooh. <laughs> um maybe one or two more comments before we move on to our next thing. And if if there are no more, uh, that's okay. 
Um, yep, thank you. Wendy, thanks for sharing. So, so the next thing you know, is kind of special. Um, typically, we would just throw, uh, show the movies and do some feedback. But because this is a special night for Minwift and Docu Club and even Film North, um, we decided we wanted to end it with something special and then allow a couple of our special guests to speak. And so what's special is Rita is a filmmaker that finished a film. It, it, Melody Gilbert worked with her. She took a class at Film North um, to kind of help push her over the edge to finish it. And something we've seen in all of your films and Rita talks about it in, uh, often and in a special article um, in a paper that we posted was vulnerability in how putting yourself in the story and um, giving the audience um, something to really kind of bite into. And so we thought we would show her trailer um, and then allow her to share a few words. Then we would really like Melody to share a few words of wisdom. And since Thalia could be here and you instructed three of our students, maybe you could share a few words of wisdom. And then Chris would like, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about Dacia Club because you've inspired me and that's really why this night took place was because of what you guys do. And I thought Minwift would appreciate it. And then I'll wrap it up and we should be done, you know, well before 8.30, but um, anything else you wanna say about Rita, Chris, or ask Rita before we show her trailer? Well, I'll just uh, clarify um, that, yeah, we're watching a trailer of a finished film. You, you did set that up earlier, Sandra, but, um, and then maybe after the film, Rita and Melody can talk uh, about, obviously we'll have some, hear, hear some words of wisdom, but um, also you can remind us uh, how we might um, get a chance to see the film in its entirety, a feature length documentary. So, um, and it's about what, a two minute trailer, right? roughly. All right, let's roll it. Hi, yes, my name is Rita Davern and I'm from St. Paul. I'm a settler descendant trying to sort out a piece of land down here called Pike Island. Who are my people? Where do I come from? And what is my dream? I grew up with a lot of blank in my past, a lot of unknowns. I never heard anything growing up that there were Indians on the land great grandpa settled on. I don't care what is in my history. I don't care what's good about it. I don't care what's hard about it. I want a chance to claim it and face it and learn from it. The entire Minnesota rivers contained villages of Dakota people. We called that area Badote. I'm gonna find out what the hell happened to the land that my family settled on and how it happened and why. This is our history and this is where we are right now. Let's claim it and own all of ourselves, not own just this piece that we can't get over. When trauma happened, it got passed down. So it's not over. When people learn this story, it, it changes them. Let's get angry and do something. To hell with guilt and shame. To hell with them. All right, that's great. So, um... I would like to uh, give the floor over to our filmmakers. Um, so we have co-producers and co-directors, uh, Rita Davern and Melody Gilbert here. Um, and I think uh, it might be just fun to hear, hear, hear you tell us a little bit about the film and, and any, any other uh, words, of, any words of wisdom you might wanna to share with, uh, share with us. Uh, well, Sandra said, be sure to talk about vulnerability. So there's a good story around that because um, when we started this project and I went to Melody, having been through her um, documentary boot camp, uh, I asked her if she, once I got a grant, I asked her if she would help 
um, get involved in the film. Uh, so I could, you know, I needed, desperately needed some expertise. <laughs> and she, um, she did and she changed the whole film. I mean, she, it was, I thought I was making a film about my dead grandma. And she said, sorry, Rita, but this film is about you. And we're following you on a journey and we're gonna find out what's behind this passion you have for your family history. Like what's, what's this all about? So we did, and it changed the whole trajectory of the film and um, it became what it is um, today. And, but it all required me becoming very vulnerable about my family history that I didn't want anybody to know at that point. So it wasn't easy. So we had a tussle back and forth <laughs> over a period of months. And she, I, she's such a good interviewer, you know, like she sits down with you and you're telling her your deepest secret in the first five minutes. And of course, then you're starting to have show your deepest feelings. That's Melody. She's really, really, really brilliant at that. And so then I would have this session where I'd be showing feelings and, you know, things I don't tell anybody. And she'd say this, now we've got a film. And I'd say, you can't show that. <laughs> you can't show that. I'm not showing anybody that. So we had a lot of really um, hard uh, discussions back and forth, but I finally got it. I, people kept telling me, trust Melody. She knows what she's talking about. And uh, I, we finally, I finally got it that this is what moves people is a chance to see the real you and the real um, hard things behind your life. So that's that's all I have to say tonight. Can you say a few more things about the hard things? Because I know you had to bring your family in, and that that was there were some challenges there. Right. Well, I was making a family history doc, but my family didn't want any part of it. So um, I kind of tricked them, and I um, we had a family gathering, and I told them I think it was two days beforehand that Melody and Miles were were going to come and with cameras and I didn't give them a choice about it and they blessed their hearts they showed up anyway and pretty much you know Melody and Miles would walk into the room and they would walk out of the room you know, like it wasn't easy and so we worked through for a number of months their reluctance and I I had to work my butt off to figure out how I can include them and actually have it work so that we could still be in, you know, have a relationship. So we're still working on some of that, but it was a big deal and they took a chance and we took a chance and Melody and Miles were very patient with me as I sorted through, my brother will be in here for two minutes and no more, you know? So it's all good. Uh, the last I heard from him, by the way, Melody, is he saw the shortened version, the, the TV version of the film. And he said, Rita, it's changed so much. It's much better and it's not hard on me. So that was his last. Well, what's yeah. so funny about that is that his part is actually still the same, yeah. but in Nothing. his mind, it yeah. became shorter. That's yeah. very funny. <laughs> well, he's just getting more used to it. But yeah. anyway, well, Rita set that up great. Um, yeah, she was making a movie about her grandmother, uh, great grandmother, which really, you know, I would have gone on that journey, except for Rita was much more interesting. And uh, I wasn't trying to get things from you. I was just trying to understand what you wanted to make. And so um, I do want to mention that I think you had been to Doc Club already at least once with what you called some name I never heard of before. What was it again? I call it rough cut, but you called it a uh, preview. Oh yeah. She had made like a 20 minute sort of look like a, I don't know, public TV historical documentary about with boats and grandma pictures and stuff like that. But it's like, I could see there was something there. I just didn't, well, you didn't really know what it was either. And in all this talking, we finally got down to what it needed to be. And we did start over. And one of the things I want to mention for all of you is that we started over. One of the reasons we could start over is because I do, I shoot. So I have my own camera. And also Miles uh, Painter, who's our editor, also shoots. And 
you know, basically we just started filming Rita doing everything, which was super annoying. I'm sure we were hanging around all the time and you were, you know, she got to be, I guess you just got a little used to us just filming you. I'm like, oh, Rita, it's your birthday. What are you doing today? Or let's, <clears throat> let's film your family reunion. So I just want to say Rita's a very brave, courageous human to eventually uh, come to that conclusion that it is what makes people feel connected. And, you know, then we ended up moving into co-directing and co-producing and all of the things it takes to make a film, a real film, a feature film. And we did have a feature length version that went into um, film festivals. And um, then we had to cut it down for the TPT version. And that was all part of my job uh, as producer at that point. So anyway, I'm rambling, but I wanted to mention about the, how important it is to have rough cut screenings and have feedback from people you don't know who aren't your friends, who aren't your relatives. <laughs> I think we had a whole bunch of rough cut screenings, uh, some doc clubs, some random people, um, a bunch of times. So that was really important to do. There's probably some people here who saw their early cuts. I mean, uh, I don't know if you've seen the most recent TPT version, but it is pretty different. So. Mm. Is that, sorry, is that, di so that's different than the one that was in um, the festival? Yeah. So yeah, it's shorter. Okay, because I, I think that's, I saw the longer one then. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, that one was uh, 70 something yeah. minutes, I can't remember, but you know, when you go into the broadcast world, you got to change the, right. the length, but yeah. Um, yeah, rough cut screenings are important. <laughs> oh, excuse me, one second, I got my dog out, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I mentioned Chris Newberry was yeah. a part of our film crew more than once too. So thank oh, you yeah. for him. Right. Chris, in on Melody. Chris jumped in. Yeah. 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 That was fun, fun project to work on. And I was yeah. one of those people who saw the uh, evolution through uh, <laughs> rough cut screening. So yeah, um, it was, yeah, very gratifying to see it all come together and so cool that you're having your broadcast now. So tell us again, um, remind us, yeah, oh. Sandy mentioned the DVR because it's a late night screening. Is that our best way to see the film if we want to check it out or do you there's want people a, to see the longer one? There's another film festival coming up in the end of May. It's not official yet, but yeah. um, if you check our website, um, storiesidentknow.com, you will be able to see that or Facebook, you know, um, but that's coming up um, soon. Yeah, and, and there is that one other run on TPT that people, if they want to screen it, it's been screening a lot, like I think five, six, seven times, something like that. But the last one coming up is at 3 a.m. on, I don't know the date, but it is the on the 7th, I think. The 7th, yeah. Yeah, um, and then it's going into educational distribution too, so there'll be DVDs available and screenings for anybody, organizations who want to. And I do want to mention, I want to thank Chris Newberry for taking over Doc Club. Um, it was my baby for a long time, for about 15 years I started it. It was actually an outgrowth of Film North uh, classes that I was teaching there. And Chris, you've just done such a great job of continuing and uh, partnering with other organizations and it's just wonderful. And it's open to anybody and everybody. You don't have to be a filmmaker to be to go to Doc Club. In fact, we used to love it when my teacher friends would just show up or you know, some random people came because those are your audience. Like, especially those of you asking questions, like, I don't know who would want to see this. And when you get people who aren't filmmakers that come to Doc Club, that's also really fun. And I also want to thank Sandra for uh, your energy and enthusiasm for MinWift and partnerships and as you said at the beginning, I was a founding member of the actual MinWift. Not, I think it was a, it was a small board. I think is Kathy Ferry here? I think she was in that group. Kathy, were you? Weren't we part of the original original people? Anyway, um, but it's also a wonderful organization, and you know something everybody should look into. Minnesota is a very supportive filmmaking community. I live in Louisiana now, so I don't have a filmmaking community. So y'all lucky to have each other and I appreciate still being part of all this. Oh, hi, Kathy, I saw that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks for your kind words, Melody. It's, it was, it's an honor to have you. Uh, it's always great to have you tune in from Louisiana, but it's an honor to have you on, on tonight since you were so instrumental in both Docky Club and, and Minwift. Um, did you, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of Docky Club in a minute, but um, I think I want, I want to make sure, um, Melody and Rita, did you, either of you had anything else you wanted to say um, about the film or the process? Um, Rita, when I, somebody was asking about the grant that you got, right? Yeah, in the chat. How did you get the grant? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I, my whole experience of filmmaking is about networking. So everything that happened that made my film possible happened because I met somebody who could give me a little hand. And one of those people was Maxine Davis, who um, made Women Outward Bound. And I've got to follow her film and her experience of making it with Melody um, through the whole process. It was so great. Um, mm -hmm. And she got a grant from the O'Shaughnessy Foundation. And I you know, found out that you can't apply for those grants. You can't, it, they have to find you and you're not supposed to call them. So I just said to Maxine one day, do you think they'd be interested in this St. Paul Irish Catholic film? Because it's a very Irish Catholic St. Yeah. Paul organization. <laughs> and she said, I'll ask. So she asked and they said, great. So they, they ended up giving us three grants, which uh, made the whole thing possible. That's yeah. great. And um, I know Talia, do, would, would you, would you like to say any uh, parting words of wisdom since you <laughs> saw a lot of your students uh, show their stuff here today? Yeah. Um, parting words of wisdom. Take Melody Gilbert's class if you can ever do that, because she is just a phenomenon. I mean, I'm so glad you're here and good to talk to you after so long. <laughs> um, um, and, um, you know, I, I feel like everything's kind of been said. I mean, I think the whole idea of vulnerability is really important because there's nothing like being on the other side of the camera to uh, make you aware. You know, if you are constantly documenting, try to turn it around and it is, it can be terrifying. And so I think it's just something um, that to be aware of, you know, when you're, telling someone else's story. Um, that's something we talk about in class is, you know, but I think it's all, I mean, all this has been wisdom. I mean, it's about collaboration. It's about building relationships. And, um, you know, um, the other thing I just wanna say, if you're new is this is a long and arduous process. And so just, if you're working on something and you're feeling frustrated, I just want to give a pep talk, like don't give up. I mean, this and, and venues like this are, we're so lucky to have this because again, it's been said, but the more, it, it can also be terrifying to show it, but the more you do and the more you get what other people are getting from it, um, it's, it's profound. And so I just want to encourage everyone who's working on something who might be new at this to just keep working and I know it goes in ebbs and flows and we have to survive and all that stuff, but um, just know that it's, it's not, I mean, you can work on the open for a year, you know, just that piece of it until it's right. So just know that it's, um, it's hard and I just admire everyone for, for doing it. And um, just one little side thing. I also just want to say thank you, Sandy, for organizing this and your you and Chrissy, such great moderators. So thank you for that. And um, I hope that you are working on your film, not to be pushy or anything, but. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Yeah. And it, if you want to um, follow in any of these filmmakers footsteps and take some classes, including, Talia, are you teaching at Film North these days uh, sometimes? Yes, I'm teaching. I'm still teaching the um, beginning documentary. And what I actually, speaking of critique, what I am offering, and we'll see how it goes because it's a new thing, is we're doing like a, um, what we're doing is like a um, critique lab 
Um, and so for people who do have works in progress, it will be a chance for longer critiques, um, not just from me, but from a small class, from a small group. But also what I'm gonna do is add, um, you know, depending on, I'm gonna tailor it to what people are working on. So if you're working on a certain type of film, we're gonna be looking at work and talking about those issues that you might come up with. And it's actually also for any type, it can be experimental or narrative as well. It's not strictly documentary. So um, that's coming up. Anybody is interested? That sounds great. And uh, Melody has a boot camp coming up too. Um, there's in the in the chat here, there's been a fair number of links put up, including uh, finding out about those classes. But uh, the easy way to do it is just to go to filmnorth.org, their new URL, <laughs> filmnorth.org. And, um, and, and they, there's a class schedule there. You can find out about the classes and sign up. Um, I, uh, so, uh, I know that uh, Sandy will probably want to uh, give some um, some parting remarks and maybe talk a little bit more about Minwith, but uh, because we have some uh, guests on here, including myself, who are relatively new to Minwith and, and its programming. Um, but I did want to just take an opportunity to plug again Docu Club. Uh, it's free to join. We're sort of a loose knit group. Uh, all, all it requires is that you show up and it's been really cool, um, during the, during the pandemic that we've been able to, uh, widen our geographic reach and someday we will be back in person at Film North, I'm sure, hopefully not too long into the future, but hope maybe we'll also try and keep a, um, uh, a Zoom component to it. Who knows? We'll see if I can juggle that. I'm, I'm always in awe of my kids' teachers doing in person and uh, Zoom teaching at the same time. Um, but anyway, yes, please, anyone who, or, or, or if you have friends who just wanna join, like Melody said, you don't have to be a filmmaker. You could be just film curious, or you could just be a film lover. We love to have everybody join us. And um, we, uh, so the best way to do that is uh, we are pretty active on Facebook and, and there's a Facebook DocuCo group, which you can find Docu Club Minnesota on Facebook and um, asked to join the group. Um, and we a lot of interesting uh, topics are talked about on, on the Facebook page, the Facebook group as well. But that's also a great way to find out about our upcoming events. Um, or uh, in the chat a little bit earlier, I also put a, a, an email address. It's docuclub at chrisnewberry.com. And if you send, a, send an email there, uh, you'll end up on the email list as well. And our next Docu Club is coming up in, on April 30th, so just a few weeks away. And hope everybody can join. Um, we'll send out a Zoom link to anybody who's uh, who's on our email list or who uh, messages me via the Facebook group. Um, this has been. I'll I'll hand this over to uh, Sandy. But this has been a lot of fun. Um, it's been great to see some familiar faces, some new faces, some really inspiring work, personal storytelling. It was a great night, so thanks for letting me be involved, and uh, and thanks to Sandy for inviting me and putting it on. Thank you, Chris, for agreeing to do it with me. I um, I've been a fan of Melodies forever, and I think just what looking at the narrative films I had done, they were based on true stories, and so I thought it was time that I dip my toe over in that side. So I started out with your boot camp a while ago and then I took a um, class in iPhone filmmaking. Film North has been my friend and then during the pandemic I saw Thalia's class and took it. And I always take these classes and I don't, I put zero expectation on myself so that if I end up doing something I'm excited and if I don't I don't beat myself up. And so Having both of you as mentors and being able to join Docu Club with Chris brings me this excitement um, that is so important. And so Min Wift is an organization that is truly trying to support women in filmmaking. And I, in, in doing my narrative shorts, 
I saw there were boys clubs. They just get together and make movies all the time. And I'm not sure why the world with women filmmakers is different, but it is. Um, and it there's challenges associated with it. So I love that Men Whip accepts everyone as a member, all genders, all backgrounds. And the vision and the mission is to support women in um, working uh, in film, television, and new media. And so I feel supported by them. I feel supported by Docu Club. I, feel, I cannot believe how well I feel supported by Film North. And that's like a really well-oiled machine. So the opportunity to bring Chris in and work with us and as the process to get filmmakers, filmmakers seem to have um, um, self uh, doubt and not always know if they want their films shown. And so I kind of talked some people into coming tonight and I'm so happy. We had the gamut from very, very beginning putting footage together to the next step where we're close to footage being done and moving into color and sound to we think we're done to we're done and we're showing on TPT and getting grants. And so thank you for that. And then coincidentally, coincidentally Wendy and Rita are MinWift members. Um, Rita and Wendy are um, DocuClub members. Thalia taught Way, Christina, me, Wendy. Melody taught Wendy, me. So I'm saying these things because partnership is so important. You know, when you work together, things happen. When you think you need to be above someone or, you know, that doesn't happen. So I think I love how Min Wift is using this pandemic to reach out and work with people and support people and provide opportunities for people to look to learn at either um, with no charge or relatively low charge min with membership is $55 for a year if you're a full member there's a student membership for $25 there's a corporate membership for 250 and that's for 10 people so um I just encourage you to check out min with whether you want to become a full-time member or uh, just attend the events. We have these events called Minwift Mondays, where you will see information from the film board, information on taxes as a filmmaker, how, and maybe someone that doesn't have a W-2 or a 1099, how can you have tax incentives? Um, there's a voiceover class coming up. Uh, we may do some other partnership events. We want to hear from you. What do you want us to do? And, and, um, an experience like tonight, was this helpful? I have one final poll question I'm gonna be asking you guys, but I just wanna say, I have so much gratitude for the people that I have met and uh, learned from and that have helped and supported and mentored me. And I feel like tonight was one of those nights that just kind of warmed my heart because it all came together uh, with really important people, the filmmakers and the special guests, you know, Melody, Thalia, Chris, um, thank you for agreeing to this. <laughs> and you're all over the place. So it's nice to know that 70% of you said you really appreciated that you could be online with us tonight, or you might not have been able to participate. So inclusivity, accessibility, welcoming spirit to everyone is really important to MinWIP. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, I am going to do a final poll. Um, I do sometimes like to take a picture of all the people that have participated. I will stop the recording um, and I would love to take a picture. So let me first do a final poll here. So it sounds like this might have been a success and was appreciated. So.